This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Christmas, the most magical time of year. A time of snow, hot chocolate, and the one month of the year when the retail sector's finances are actually in the green. But for me, there won't be any sledding, ice skating, or snowmen, because I live in Florida, where all we've got are rednecks, old people, and hurricanes. That means if I want a winter wonderland for Christmas, I'm gonna have to make it myself. In previous videos on refrigeration, I focused on getting really cold temperatures, culminating in liquid nitrogen at minus 196 C. In this video, instead of trying to go as cold as possible, I'm gonna try to go as big as possible and build a device for quickly freezing enormous ice cubes. Now ice is typically pretty boring. Heck, even Peltier coolers can make ice, and those things are absolute garbage. But I'm not making some piddly little ice cubes to put in my lemonade. I want something that can freeze hundreds of pounds of water in one go. You could do this in a large chest freezer, but the problem is that a typical fridge or freezer uses static air to transfer heat, meaning it's incredibly slow, and even if the freezer's evaporator was in direct contact with the water, they usually only have one or two hundred watts of cooling power. A chest freezer is fine for storing dead bodies, but if we want to freeze several hundred pounds of water in one go, we're going to need a much more powerful system, and it's going to need much better heat transfer capability. The first approach I used to doing this was to imitate the mechanism of a countertop ice maker. These have an evaporator that's shaped kind of like a row of fingers. These fingers are dipped into liquid water, and as the evaporator pulls heat away from the water, it freezes around the fingers. That's simple enough, but the trick is in releasing the ice, since once it's frozen, it's pretty well stuck to the evaporator fingers, even though they're really smooth and slippery. This is where the ice maker differs a little bit from a refrigerator or an air conditioner. So in addition to the usual compressor, condenser, throttle, and evaporator, ice makers have an additional valve that allows hot, high-pressure refrigerant vapor to bypass the condenser and throttle and go directly into the evaporator. This effectively turns the evaporator into a condenser, causing it to rapidly heat up, and and causing the ice that's in contact with the fingers to melt, which releases the ice cubes, creating that distinct ring shape. Now the fingers in question are usually pretty small, like maybe an inch long and a quarter inch diameter. I wanted to see if I could scale this up, so I built a prototype system that used a one inch diameter pipe with a 10 inch length as the evaporator. And it actually worked pretty well, like with this glass of water, which it froze in about an hour without any insulation. Of course, that's only a few hundred grams of ice, but still something. In two hours, it was able to freeze a one liter container solid, which was pretty fun to play with. You could even freeze your own juice cup with it. Then I tried to freeze this igloo in a 3D printed mold, and it got most of the way there, but didn't quite freeze the entrance because I wasn't using any insulation. I then scaled up the idea using a compressor from a 5000 BTU air conditioner unit using a 3 inch diameter, 24 inch long pipe as the evaporator. The idea here was to have the entire thing be a single piece unit and just stick it in a big trash can or bucket without taking up extra space. And while it technically did work, in tests I was beginning to run into that pesky square cube law which was going to put a damper on this whole rod evaporator concept. If you're not familiar, the square cube law is basically the mathematical principle that as an object gets bigger, its volume goes up by the cube of its size, but its surface area only goes up by the square of its size. What this means is that as any object gets scaled up, the heat transfer behavior changes because the surface area to volume ratio is going down. This is why snow immediately melts if it falls onto a warm surface, but you can drop a house-sized ice cube in the Sahara Desert and it would take weeks to completely melt. In the case of the ice maker, sizing it up to a 3 by 24 inch pipe increased the surface area more than six fold over the small prototype, but the volumes it would be handling would be hundreds of times higher. Not to mention that because of the radial geometry, traveling further away from the evaporator rod meant not only less heat transfer, but a wider area over which the heat had to be transferred. I guess if I had studied geometry better in preschool, I could have avoided this mistake. For this to be practical at a large scale, the geometry needs to be the other way around. The refrigerant evaporator needs to completely encircle the water being frozen and freeze it from the outside in. By doing this, the water is exposed to the maximum possible surface area for heat transfer, and as you get further away from the cooling source, the area needing to be frozen gets reduced, which is the exact opposite situation that the central evaporator had. Now, in a perfect world, this would be done by having a sealed outer jacket welded to the ice cube container, which serves as the evaporator for the refrigerant, giving the system nearly perfect thermal contact. But that's way beyond my lowly fabrication abilities as a stinky peasant in a garage, so instead, I'm just going to wrap the ice cube 
cube container with a copper coil as an evaporator and place the whole thing in a tub full of water to maximize the heat transfer from the container to the coil. The water in the tub will be a 20-30% to 30 solution of calcium chloride to depress its freezing point so that it stays liquid at the evaporator's operating temperature. This is really important because if the tub water freezes, there won't be any way to get the ice cube container out of it. I was a little bit concerned that the calcium chloride might cause corrosion to the copper refrigeration coil, but after leaving this sample of copper in a 30% calcium chloride solution for over two months, I didn't notice any major corrosion, just a little bit of discoloration. Anyway, the ice cube will be far too heavy to remove from the tub by hand, so it'll be hoisted out by a winch and then flipped over. Once the outer surface of the container warms up a bit, it should slide right off the ice and we'll be left with our enormous cube. Here's the pot that'll contain the ice cube. It's a 25 gallon or 95 liter aluminum stock pot. I would get a bigger one, but this is as big as I could find. To get a sense of scale, here's my dog inside the pot. Seems like he's pretty comfy in there. The handle rivets will get in the way of releasing the ice, so they're drilled out and the holes are plugged with silicon. The red silicon is for high temperature stuff, but it's all I had at the time. Then I wrapped a hundred feet of half inch coil around the pot, which didn't come out nearly as pretty as I was hoping, and when I turned the pot on its side, the coil popped out like a spring, so I had to add all these zip ties to keep the windings in place. But I just remembered, I gotta pay for all this crap somehow. So look at this dog, this funny looking dog. According to archaeologists, this is a website from the World Wide Web. Using carbon dating, they've determined that it's from the year 1998. Now, if you're a business type of person doing very businessy things, you're going to need a website that looks modern and professional and not like a prehistoric cave wall drawing. And Squarespace is the perfect service for that. Squarespace provides all the tools you need to build and host a website for your business. Graphic design, media integration, payment processing, inventory management, appointment scheduling, traffic analytics, and even the ability to run ads on social media for your business. Squarespace has it all in one easy to use system that doesn't require any programming knowledge. Whether you're a neighborhood kid selling lemonade or a big shot Wall Street guy running a giant multinational cryptocurrency scam, I mean brokerage, Squarespace is able to cover all your website needs. I mean, seriously, who's got the time to learn HTML or PHP? We're on the brink of world war and you should probably be learning to dig a trench, not worry about website coding. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and if you want to launch a website, go to squarespace.com slash hyperspacepirate to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. Next, I got this 85 gallon or 320 liter portable pool for the coil and the calcium chloride solution. Apparently, some people actually fill these with ice and swim inside them. That seems like a really expensive way to freeze to death when you could just wander into the freezer area of a grocery store and fall asleep. I've got an R410 compressor from a 10,000 BTU window air conditioner unit and the half inch return line from the evaporator coil piped to it. Then I add the evaporator pressure gauge, condenser coil, fan, and filter dryer. Instead of a capillary tube or expansion valve, the throttle device will simply be a needle valve connected to flare fittings on the evaporator inlet, allowing me to fine tune the refrigerant flow with minimal complexity. Then I add a 12 volt power supply for the big condenser fan, a condenser pressure gauge, a fill valve, and then vacuum the system down and start adding propane refrigerant. Let's give it a test run. It does seem to be icing up after a minute or so, but it's only pulling around 450 watts. I can pull up to 1800 watts before I pop my breaker, and by god I intend to use all 1800, so what's going wrong here? Well, actually nothing was wrong at all. The compressor was working fine, and the pressures and temperatures were all good. The thing is, for a given condenser and evaporator temperature, propane has much less pressure than R410, which is what this compressor was designed for. With R410, this compressor would pull 7 or 800 watts at the same temperature, and also produce more cooling power because R410's density and pressure is so much higher. This results in the compressor being underloaded when it uses propane as a refrigerant, which there's nothing wrong with, it just means you're not getting the maximum potential out of the compressor. The solution would be to replace the compressor with one that's designed for R22. For a given temperature, R22 and propane have extremely close saturation pressures, so an R22 compressor can reach its full potential running with propane as a refrigerant. Basically, for a given power, the R22 compressor is optimized for a relatively high volumetric flow rate, whereas the R410 compressor is designed for a lower volumetric flow rate at a higher pressure. And it's not a negligible difference either. Suppose you had saturated vapor returning to the compressor at 5 degrees C, the R410 would be nearly three times denser than the propane. So obviously the system needs a compressor with a higher volumetric flow rate, which fortunately I do have. But then I had a crazy idea. What if instead of replacing the compressor, I put it in parallel with the existing one? I've never tried this before, nor have I seen anyone else try it, but since the compressors have internal check valves, in theory it should work. 
Instead of one really huge compressor, I'll just have two with each one having its own condenser and filter dryer. Then the condenser outlets will converge on the throttle valve and the return flow from the evaporator will just be split between the two compressors. Here's what the system looks like with the two compressors plumbed in. I was really worried that there might be some issues with load imbalance or something like that, but they seem to play along pretty nicely with each other, even though the R22 compressor is doing close to two thirds of the work. Now we're pulling some real power and the coil started freezing up within moments of turning on the system. The next thing I did was load test it by adding 15 gallons of water from a garden hose. Within about 20 minutes, I noticed ice building up on the coils and after about two hours, there was a pretty good sized frozen donut in the tub. The system reached a steady state of about 1400 watts and the pressures were at about 210 and 30 or 15 and a half and 3.1 bar absolute on the condenser and evaporator respectively. The remarkable thing about this system is how much heat it moved compared to other builds I've done. Just walking into the garage, I could feel the heat coming off the condensers. You can see here how much the air temperature changes as I move this thermocouple into the condenser airflow a few feet away. At 24 hours, practically the entire thing was frozen over. Mind you, this was in a warm garage with no insulation whatsoever on the tub, as you can see from the ice forming on the outside. I'm willing to bet at least two thirds of my cooling power was being lost to the surroundings, especially with the bottom surface of the tub being in direct contact with the concrete floor. So I've gone ahead and added a generous amount of insulation around the tub and added the ice cube pot and filled it with 22 gallons or 83 liters of water. Then I filled 15 gallons in the tub and got a bunch of calcium chloride to reduce the freezing point of the tub water. I added a total of 40 pounds or 18 kilos of the stuff, which should make it about a 24% solution, which should theoretically stay liquid until minus 30 C. But in reality, it ended up freezing around minus 10 to minus 15 C, although it made really soft, mushy ice, so that may not be a problem as long as I can pull the ice cube pot out. Then I stuck a foam panel on top to make sure the system was completely covered, and at this point it really doesn't look much different from a chest freezer, but it's a hell of a lot more powerful. Starting off with room temperature water, we're at almost 1600 watts, 240 psi on the high pressure side, and 50 psi on the low pressure side, or about 17.5 and 4.5 bar absolute. After a couple hours, the temperature near the coils had dropped to minus 36 C, and we can see some ice forming in the bottom of the pot. There's also ice forming on the sides, but it's almost perfectly clear, so you can't really see it in the video. It seems to be kind of freezing in a U-shaped pattern like this. By this time the propane pressure had dropped quite a bit too, and the compressors had gotten cool enough that the cold vapor was freezing the outside of the liquid traps. The throttle valve is completely iced up too. After just under 24 hours, the whole system is frozen, including the calcium chloride solution in the cooling bath. In total, there's about 310 pounds of ice here, or 140 kilos. The calcium chloride ice ended up hardening enough that I couldn't pull the ice pot free, even after trying to hit it with an ice pick. I didn't have the foresight to install a reversing valve or even a hot gas bypass on my refrigeration system, so I just ran it with the condenser fans turned off and the throttle valve wide open, which basically did the same thing as a hot gas bypass. After about an hour of doing this, the coils had warmed up the cooling bath ice enough to break it loose from the pot. To remove the ice block, I built this crane with a winch at the top and slowly raised the pot out of the cooling bath. The crane has caster wheels so I can move it clear of the cooling bath. Then I lower the pot back to the ground, flip it over, and within a few minutes the surface of the pot warms up enough that I can slide it off the ice. And that's perfect, it's frozen all the way through. Then I nearly throw out my back trying to push it out of the garage. I think a smarter approach would have been to pull it with a harness. So there's almost 200 pounds of solid shiny ice. It makes these funny looking bubbles on the bottom as it melts. Let's see what sort of evil stuff we can do to it. I'll start with this red hot weight. This thing only went two to three inches into the ice. I expected a lot more. What's really funny is that it left behind scale that could be picked up with a magnet. How about molten copper? What's really interesting is how initially it just sort of hydroplanes on top of the ice from the Leyden frost effect, and it's several seconds before the steam really starts up.
There's the solid chunk and a whole lot of splattered copper beads on the ground. It came out really shiny and I think that's because the rapid cooling and steam seem to shield it from oxidation. It's also really satisfying to chop with a machete. It kind of makes me want to carve an ice sculpture. If I add a little acetone, I can set it on fire and it sort of looks like a giant wax candle burning. And surprisingly, most of it is still there the next morning and then there's probably about 30% of it left 24 hours later. The second cube froze much faster since the cooling bath was already cold when I started it. Within about 18 hours, it was already totally solid. I tried the molten copper experiment again, but this time I made a little depression to guide the metal into so that it didn't slide off the cube like last time. This time it actually went more than halfway down into the ice before it solidified and cooled, and I wasn't able to get it out by hand. This led to me using a strategically placed firecracker to bust open the block so that I could recover my casting. I think this one looks nicer than the first, but it's still kind of shaped like poop. The next block was loaded onto a dolly because it's going to be going on a field trip to the backyard. I'm going to push it in the pool and figure out how long it'll last in warm water. In warm air, the block lasted a little over 24 hours, so I'm going to guess it'll only survive for 2 or 3 hours in warm water. The previously opaque edges quickly became clear when they're dunked in the pool for a few minutes, which looks pretty cool. After just 23 minutes, you can already see how much has melted away, with this little lip at the top being the ice that was sticking out of the water. At 6.20 p.m., there was absolutely nothing left but some dog hair and lint that got stuck in the cube when it was freezing. So even with its huge size, the cube survived no more than three hours in the pool, which is pretty much what I estimated. Here's a new ice cube, and I'm going to see if I can use this firecracker to split it open. I used the giant drill bit to make a borehole to place the firecracker inside of, and then I packed sand in the empty space to focus the pressure inside the ice block. The wire leads coming out are to connect to a battery to start the fuse on the firecracker. Perfect. It was just enough energy to crack the ice open without throwing pieces around. Using too much energy and creating a man-made blizzard isn't something we'd want. Ask me how I know. Here's a look at the cross section of the block with one of the fragments removed. You can clearly see that the pressure widened the hole where the firecracker went off, because this was originally about half an inch or 13 millimeters. Just as a curiosity, I packed the shattered fragments back into the freezer to see if I could refreeze them back together. I didn't quite get a perfect fit, and I had to fill the remaining space with about 4 gallons or 15 liters of water. This didn't make the process much faster than starting with straight water, it was still at least 14 hours until it froze solid rather than the usual 18 to 20. But it did look pretty cool because the empty spots where the water had to be re-added were much clearer so you could see where the original fault lines were. Now you may be wondering, can ice burn? Well, of course not, that's ridiculous. Although if you pour volatile substances on top of it, those will burn, which looks pretty damn cool. Alright, see ya.